So what are embedded languages? So embedded languages, uh, simply put, it's a language written inside another language. Makes sense, right? Uh, that other language is called the host language. So uh, since we're at Haskell Implementers Workshop, that's going to be Haskell. Uh, and then this domain, this uh, this embedded language, it might be domain specific in some way. And there's a lot of ways you can do this. Uh, at the end of the day, from a user's perspective, like what they see is that they import a library, it exposes some kind of API, and that those functions, when they call it, they do some stuff, right? So you might think of the text library as an embedded domain-specific language for Unicode strings in Haskell, right? Which is, again, it's just a fancy way of saying it's a library, right? But the devil's in the details, right? So with the text library, uh, when you call one of those functions, it just implements that thing directly. So that's called a shallow embedded language. The thing that we're interested in today is this thing called a deeply embedded language. So in a deeply embedded language, instead of executing stuff directly, uh, what I'm actually going to do is build some kind of representation of my program instead, right? So uh, I can start to define my embedded language by just writing this data type. So I have this data type for expressions here. And all of the constructors in this data type are going to become the operations in my language. Right? So uh, here I just have two constructors, one uh, to inject a literal value. Uh, you give it an int, and then I get an expression of int out. Uh, I can take the successor of some expression, right? So I can write programs in this language by just directly calling the constructors, right? Um, and this is saying, like, uh, this uh, expression answer here, uh, it is a uh, an embedded expression that, once evaluated, will give me a thing of type int. That's what that's saying. Um, how do I evaluate that? I can write some kind of function that walks over this data type and kind of does the thing when it uh, when it encounters each inch, each uh, construct. Right. So, given some expression of type int, I can evaluate it to get an int out. Right? So, pretty straightforward. Um, and you might have seen this before, right? Because I've just lifted this example straight from the GHC's user's guide, right? So this is sort of the canonical example for why you might want to use a generalized algebraic data type. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this is this is sort of enough. This is the basic idea. Uh, you get your paper out of this, right? And so a lot of people will kind of stop at this point. But if you look at this language, like there's not really a lot you can do with it. So you just kind of keep running on that treadmill, uh, then eventually you end up at Haskell Implementers with, uh, like, you know, how do we actually use this? Like, once this idea kind of grows, right? So that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, right. So deeply embedded languages, right? They have some, uh, some uh, advantages, right? So they integrate well with the host language. And uh, one of the nice things is that they have no separate parsing and type checking step, right? Some very smart people have already written my type checker for me, so I can just leverage that. And that's really nice, right? A disadvantage, there's no separate parsing step. Right? <laughs> so, and this becomes a problem, right? So now uh, the, the main problem here is that my deeply embedded language has no context information. Yeah. Um, and there are other advantages and disadvantages, of course, but right, this is what we're interested in today, this idea of context, right? So what's the problem, okay? So uh, let's say we want to write a, an embedded uh, program in this embedded language, right? Okay, so I can write some code. Uh, so over here, I've written some code in this embedded language, Accelerate, okay? But, you know, if I look here, this ACC thing, so this is the hint that's kind of saying, like, ah, oh, this is... Uh, one of these expression data type things, right? This is uh, my, my data type representing some computation, right? Um, and then over here, I can see like uh, I'm calling this zip with function, but from this qualified module, a.zip with. So this isn't the real, uh, like the standard Haskell zip with. Instead, I've got this uh, zip with version from my library that's going to work over these ACC things, yeah? But, um, 
But aside from those things, right, the kind of, uh, you can see it integrates well with the, the Haskell language, right? So this is one of our goals. We want it to integrate with our Haskell language. Uh, it sort of looks like Haskell, yeah. You can tell because the longest thing here is a type signature, yeah. Um, and then, you know, I can run it, right? So I can file this program, I run it, and then, yeah, something happens, I wait, I wait, and then, okay, cool. And it says it did something, I guess, but I don't know. So if I open up my CPU monitor thing, right, and I see, like, okay, what happened? I ran my program, and the CPU got hot, great. <laughs> Uh, that's like standard functional programming, right? <laughs> Some other interesting things here, right? Uh, it ran well enough that I hit how expiry on my CPU. So it's doing something, like a lot of something. Uh, but also I could look here, right? The, the actual utilization is about 80%. So, okay, well, where do I go from, from here, right? If there's an extra 20% of my CPU that just sort of sitting idle, then how do I use that? Right. Um, yeah. So it took like thirty seconds to run this program, but you know, twenty percent of that time we're just sitting idle. So what do I do now if I want to make this go faster? Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, so I can run it again, uh, and this time I have these special secret options. Uh, so you can just think of these as like GHC RTS flags. Right. Um, to just kind of give me some insight into what's going on, right? So when I run this thing, it's going to say like, ah, yes, great. Uh, here at this time step, like a uh, half a second after the program start, uh, I'm executing my function generate underscore 47460. Nice. Yes, I remember that one, right? So, you know, very distinct from generate underscore D095, right? You know, uh, very different things. Right, like clearly these are just internal generated names, right? They have no nothing to do with the program that I actually wrote, right? Uh, and then the problem is, like, if you look over at the timings on the right hand side, right, a lot of these things take like a handful of milliseconds, and then all of a sudden something is taking like ten times longer than every, uh, than everything else, right? So, you know, if I want to optimize my program, this is probably where I want to start looking, but I have no idea what that is, right? So, yeah. So where do we go from here? All right. So, so this is the problem, right? So there's this disconnect between the embedded program that the user is writing, uh, and, and then the thing that's ultimately executed. Yeah. So the thing with deeply embedded languages is that. Uh, when you're programming with a deeply embedded language, what you're actually doing is writing a Haskell program that at program runtime will generate some kind of abstract syntax tree for you and then at runtime kind of compile that into something and then run it. Yeah? And there's a disconnect between those two things. Right? So this is the, the gap that we're going to try and close. Yeah? So we want to recover some kind of context here. Um, you know, what, what's the context of all of this deeply embedded, uh, code that I'm writing, right? Um, yeah, uh, recover that context, annotate my generated AST with the information, and then sort of find other uses for that annotation system once we have it. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, if we think about, you know, uh, how I'm writing this program, right? I write my program and it's, describing some kind of abstract syntax tree, right? So I had this uh, zip with function in my program that wasn't the regular Haskell zip with, it was zip with from my accelerate library, right? So this is the kind of entry point into my library, right? This is this one of these smart constructors, right? This is the thing that's building this abstract syntax tree for me, right? So this is the point where I need to now kind of uh, collect this information and then store it in this AST as I'm generating, right? So I have all of these, these smart constructors, these things that are building the AST for me. This is the things that we need to kind of introduce our annotations at. Right? Um, there are various ways you can, uh, uh, like these smart constructors can be encountered in your program. Uh, you can have regular functions. Um, uh, in my kind of first example, 
uh, had the construct a lit that kind of just injects a literal integer and return to an expression of integer, right? I can write this kind of smart constructor that does the same thing, right? I give it an int, it returns an expression of int, right? All it is doing is just applying that constructor, right? It's just sort of wrapped up nicely, yeah? Um, you can do neat tricks like overloading type classes, yeah? If I write a, a num instance for expressions, then I can use the regular plus symbol in my code, and then that would just generate the right abstract syntax fragment. So again, this kind of integration with the host language thing. Yeah. Uh, and then patent synonyms is the last one, right? So I can write a patent synonym like this. And so if you're interested in how do I write a patent synonym that allows me to do pattern matching in the embedded language, then I have a talk on Friday about that. So, yeah. okay. so these are the kind of entry points to uh, my deeply embedded language, right? These are the things that are generating this AST for me. So, uh, yeah, so here we want to be able to kind of store this metadata in our AST nodes uh, and the kind of side conditions for the design here is that we want these annotations to be extensible in some way and like adding them, so like changing our embedded language in order to support this shouldn't change the user-facing language, right? Users code that used to compile should still compile but now they have this extra feature, right? So that's the, that's the goal, okay. All right, so storing annotations. So I should preface this by saying that, so in the talk this morning, Simon uh, explained the way that GHC does this. It's based on this paper called Trees That Grow. It's this really wonderful, extensible, but also hugely complicated system uh, that enables them to do that. Uh, I'm gonna do the opposite in these slides, right? Uh, and just the simplest thing possible to, to demonstrate. Yeah. So uh, we had our expression language here on the first slide, and it had like our sample smart constructor, which is just generating a constant. So basically, we need some kind of new data type that's going to store all of these annotations we want to keep track of, and then you know we'll fill in what that is later. Uh, and then we're just gonna we're gonna add that to every constructor, right? So again, simplest thing possible. You can do something more complicated. Yeah. Um, and then we need some way to make this annotation structure, right? Uh, and so we need to fill in these dots here, right? What goes into this data type and then what kind of constraints does this uh, make an function require to do its thing? Okay. Uh, yeah. Ah, okay. Come on. Come on. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and then my, my smart constructor has to be kind of augmented to to call this make and function and add these annotations. Uh, but this is all internal to my library, right? This doesn't change the user's code. Uh, okay, so the first thing that we want is to to get this association between the code that the user writes and what's actually executed, right? We need this this source location back to the original code. Right, uh, and then once we have that, let's try and figure out something to do with it. Right, so try and use that for diagnostics or profiling or something. Right, see how far we go. Um, so source location. So GHC actually has two mechanisms to get source locations out of your program. So there's GHC call stacks from this module GHC.stack, uh, and if you've ever used call stacks in Haskell, this is probably the thing that you're familiar with. Right, so uh, you have to ha add this has call stack constraint to all the functions that want this, uh, and then GHC will generate this information for you at compile time. Right? Uh, libraries like Hedgehog use this uh, in a really nice way. Hedgehog is a quick check style library that tells you where your program's broken, uh, but now in a really nice way. So that's cool. Right. Uh, and then the other thing is sort of newer, I guess, this uh, RTS execution stacks. Right. And so these give you real runtime backtraces about what's happening in your program. And you also don't need to change your code, right? So with GHC call stacks, I need to add this extra constraint everywhere. Uh, but uh, with the second option, now I can just kind of get a call stack out of my running program, right? Which is great, except it's currently unusable. So uh, you need to compile GHC in a special way and it's sort of, Uh, 
Uh, but yeah, so from the three different ways that we're generating abstract syntax in our program, right? The three different kinds of smart constructors we have, right? Uh, regular functions can just use GHC call stacks. Um, pattern synonyms desugar into function calls, so we can also use GHC call stacks there. Uh, plus some trickery and a bug fix that Simon fixed very quickly. Thank you. Um, uh, but for existing type classes, so if you want to write an instance for num, because we can't change the type signatures of those things, we can't add this has call stack constraint. So the only way we could kind of get around this is to use these RTS execution stacks, which aren't really supported. So, uh, which is unfortunate. I don't know if there's a different way around that. Uh, uh, but GHC call stacks is kind of the the way to move forward for now. Okay. So, how do GHC call stacks work? So. Uh, And this is just desugaring into this implicit parameter. Right? So uh, I write this, uh, GHC sees this, and I just get to kind of pull the call stack out with this uh, implicit parameter notation. Right? So this is how it works. Right? Uh, and so if I try and use this in my program, right? So let's say I have this program like this, uh, main calls foo, which calls bar. Uh, in bar, I just want to print the call stack of how I got here. Right? And you would hope that bar prints that uh, it was called by foo, which was called by main, but uh, you'll find that it only prints bar, right? And so the problem here is that because this function here has doesn't have this call, this constraint, then uh, we kind of stop at this point, yeah? I should say though that I, I appreciate this is a feature, not a bug. Yeah. Like if foo is in some other module that I can't control, then, you know, I can't add this constraint. Right. So it is good that GHC does this for me. It just sort of magically creates call stacks, uh, when it can. Uh, but it's more like a, a has call site function. And, and the problem is that, you know, if this is code that I can control, uh, I probably would prefer if GHC tells me when I miss these things. Yeah. Uh, and then I can add it rather than kind of it's silently working, but not correctly. Um, right. Um, so to get around that, we'll do the same thing, but slightly differently, right? So uh, we'll also use an implicit parameter in the same way that has call stack works, but this is now a, like a real honest to goodness implicit parameter. Uh, uh, not this kind of magic uh, GHC version, which will just uh, uh, kind of is created out of thin air, right? So I actually have to pass this thing through, right? Um, so so uh, I have this this type now, and the key thing here is that this uh, this opaque type thing, I'm not going to export that at all, right? So the only way to satisfy this constraint uh, is to go via this function, right? and so this magical function is going to give me this sourced map constraint, which is functionally equivalent to just saying has call stack, but it makes sure when I compile my program that I have the call stack everywhere, right? I haven't just forgotten the point somewhere, uh, which is just going to silently fail, right? So this is just going to give me some, some more static guarantees that I, I have this call stack in all of the places that I need it, right? right. Just a quick question. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, would it make sense to have a GAC flag that automatically inserts uh, all of this information? Uh, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, other people in the room can probably answer that better. So, yeah. All right. Okay. So if we go back to our example here, and I'm just going to replace this has call stack. To, to keep this entire 
whole stack, the entire function chain. So this is good, right? Uh, you have another example here. Uh, if I try and use this source map thing when I don't have this has call stack constraint, I do get a runtime error now that says, hey, you, you forgot to add this constraint. Uh, Richard looks very confused. Like, uh, has call stack is just this magic thing that GHC generates, right? But if it's not there, then I'll get a, an empty call stack, essentially. So I will get that implicit parameter out, but it will be empty, and then there's nothing I can do with it. Yeah. Um, so this is a runtime error, which is unfortunate, but at least it points me to where the place that I missed the thing, and I can fix it. Right? Um, and so I just fix it by, by adding this constraint. Yeah. So that's the basics, right? Um, <clears throat> So with this, we can kind of put it all together, right? So our make annotation function, now it has this new source maps constraint, and from that I can, I can rip out the call stack that I need. Um, and then my smart constructor here needs this, this usual has call stack constraint, and then it just wraps the usual thing in this source map thing, which, which gives it this necessary constraint. Um, yeah, so this is our it's kind of annotation structure that then we can use to to add to all of the AST nodes. Cool. Uh, and then over here we can add other stuff. Like once we have some kind of annotation structure on each AST node, then you know we can we can put more stuff in it, and we can write functions to kind of traverse these annotations and and do things with it. Uh, I won't really talk about that, but you know you can do things like say you should inline this more aggressively or unroll these loops, etc. Okay. Um, so case study. So applying this. So we applied this to this deeply embedded language uh, that we had uh, in the first example, right? So this is this uh, embedded language for data parallel computations, data parallel array computations, right? Uh, it's interesting just because there are multiple backends for this. Uh, there, there's lots of different expression types going on and multiple different AST types. So yeah. Uh, so the main changes that have to happen here. So the first phase is this thing called sharing recovery, where we uh, have to find all of the shared parts of the program based on stable names. Right? Um, so yeah. So the new thing here is that now we have to keep track of all the, the annotation state as we do this conversion, and you have to be a little bit careful there to not kind of destroy the sharing in the stable names, but um, can do it, uh, or you can not be careful and just ignore that sharing, uh, which gives you an easy way to just do to forcibly inline stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, and then the other main thing is array fusion. So accelerate does the the usual thing where it takes uh, map.f and turns it into this thing, right? So this is the usual sort of stream fusion style uh, producer consumer fusion, right? So. Uh, this is also why we had this hash set of call stacks, right? We might be merging different uh, disjoint parts of the user program, and we just want to keep track of where are all of the different pieces of code coming from, right? Um, and yeah, we might have other optimization flags associated with this AST, but they might differ or conflict in some way. And then, oh, okay. So because this is the Haskell Implementers Workshop, I thought, it's appropriate to have a demo. So this this is let's see if this works. Excellent. All right. Uh, yeah. So I had my uh, this is my the program that we had before, right? So I can run it. My CPU gets hot, whatever. Um, but it doesn't give me any information. So um, so we're going to try and use these annotations uh, in a and hook that up into some kind of profiler, right? So this is Tracy. This is a remote monitoring profiler, but uh, I'm just running locally. So, oh, okay. Uh, so if I run my program again, uh, then I should it should start sending data, and now I'm going to get some information about okay, what was my CPU actually doing, right? So I'll just change this. Uh, sadly, I can't zoom in. Uh, so on the left, I have a bunch of threads, and it tells me okay, along the time axis, the horizontal axis, like what is each thread doing? So whenever there's a block here, it's uh, executing some kind of accelerate code. Uh, and then this other time, it's doing something. So something that we don't have 
information about. So basically, kind of Haskell runtime system stuff. Uh, and then I can see here, it's like, huh, why did this particular iteration take so long? And it's like, okay, so it's doing a lot of empty time, like 15 milliseconds between uh, executing stuff and then nothing. So what's going on here? And it's like, oh, it turns out uh, this graph here is memory usage. So here it was doing garbage collection, which for some reason took a lot longer than usual. I don't know. But then we can execute stuff again. Right? Um, and then if I click on one of these things, I can see that like, ah, this kernel was the result of uh, like fusing all of these different operations that came from this line in my source code, apparently. So um, yeah, and get statistics and, and stuff like that. Like, what, is, what is going on with my program, right? Um, so uh, yeah, still kind of work in progress, but at least now we can get an idea of like, oh, what bit of my code is being executed when? Uh, so uh, it gives you some insight into what's going on. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of information in that profiling thing. If you look around in it, you'll see things like, oh, one kernel actually is, is uh, taking up the, the lion's share of the runtime, right? So this is this thing that was taking 60 milliseconds and everything else takes like one to five, right? Uh, and so let's just kind of play around with, uh, you know, uh, can we speed this up by just unrolling the loops or something? Um, so if I run it on the CPU, so this Ryzen 9 CPU, average runtime changes from 8.66 seconds to uh, 9.6. Well, that wasn't very effective, but at least on the GPU, like it became slightly faster, you know, like 1.5% faster, uh, which is just free performance. So that's kind of nice. So this is very context sensitive, this sort of optimization, right? Whether or not to unroll loops. Um, and if you look at the details, right, if you run this program through cache grind, you'll see that, yeah, unexpectedly, oh, well, sort of as you expect, yeah, because I'm just generating a lot more instructions than my instruction cache miss rate goes up. So, uh, so at least on the CPU, this wasn't a good idea, but uh, on the GPU, it worked well, and kind of, this is just free performance, right? Uh, so at least now with this annotation system, it gives us a way to l understand what our program is doing and try and optimize it. Um, yeah, so uh, opening the door for for a, a better developer experience, hopefully. So. Um, yeah, so, so Robert did, this is Robert's work, he did kind of the first 80%, uh, I guess. So now there's another 80% to do, and then the final 20, I suppose. Uh, so there's a lot of other interesting stuff we'd like to be able to do. So now that we have this kind of detailed line information, it would be nice to kind of uh, hook that into dwarf debug symbols, for example. So you can hook your program up to GDB and figure out what's going on. Um, other kinds of optimizations, optimizations, things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this is a kind of a good start to to figuring out what our deeply embedded programs are are doing. So, yeah, thank you.